On, uh, it's not too rainy tonight, so here Matthew going to talk about this fantastic book. Um, he's been touring the country talking about it, hasn't he? I have, yeah. And we must have the traditional welcome. Oh, thank you. Um, first of all, <coughs> some of you have read the book and some of you haven't. Can you define Shadowlands, the fantastic word you've got? Uh, yeah, Shadowlands is a sort of borderline state between either something that's kind of solid or something that's melting or something that exists and something that doesn't exist so it's like a kind of um twilight zone if i can put i know that's a tv show but you know it, it, it's the sort of um states of existing but not existing um in a in a state of transition and, and it's actually been made famous by that film about cs um lewis's wife i don't know if anyone's seen that um and it, it, it's oh yeah yeah like a sort of place where distressed souls stalk um, and I didn't originally want to call it Shadow, I wanted to call it the city that fell off the cliff because I thought that had a nice rhythm, city that <laughs> fell off the cliff yeah. but the editor pointed out that sounded a little bit comic and it also perhaps sounded like it was just about one place whereas mm. um, yeah. as, as you know you've, you've very kindly read the whole thing it's about like eight vanished or vanishing places. Yeah. Did you, can you think of a childhood um, leaning towards vanishing places or things falling into the sea or is it just something that evolved you didn't even do English at university you were saying you were a historian. I, I did history yeah but I kind of wanted to do English um I suppose it, I, I've always been quite fascinated by the like juxtapositions between something in their prime mm -hmm. and something in a state of kind of decay yeah um or just complete absence and where that comes from I think it's probably actually books about London, um, of all things, because before I wrote this, I did one on Lost London. Um, you were like a time traveller and you get parachuted in to different times, and it's written in the second person, the present tense. Um, and I was a big fan of um, all those writers like Ian Sinclair and Peter Aykroyd yeah. and um, Will Self and Moore, who were just obsessed with the sort of echoes of the past, even if the landscape's completely changed, you, you get echoes of what it once was. Um, and there's a lot of that in this, you know, when, when they go to the, the, the clifftop in Dunwich and stare out where there used to be a drowned medieval city. You know, the, all, all those writers and, and musicians and artists who went there, they can somehow still feel it. So I think in my formative years, I read a lot of Sinclair Aykroyd and um, Siebold, we were just talking about, uh, and th that's probably where it comes from. Yeah. What about as a child? I always have to ask people what their comfort book was as a child, <coughs> so I remember. Uh, that's a very good question. Probably uh, um, Take your time, The Inferno, you? Dante's Inferno. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Foucault. Um, no, they pr probably, uh, well, there was quite a lot of Alice in Wonderland going on. So mm -hmm. C.S. Lewis, maybe I hadn't actually made that connection. Yeah. Um, it's quite a lot of, um, Philip Pullman in the end, I suppose, but I don't know if that quite counts as childhood, but th those sorts of books that veered into fantasy, yeah. it's like John Wyndham, that, that, that kind of thing. And, and I think one of the, I think when popular history is done in an interesting, sort of engaging fashion, um, it is a bit like sci-fi, because it's like you're yeah. being, these people have our, like, the same biology as us, but they operate under such a different mindset <laughs> and in a completely different universe, which is kind of like ours, but, but not. You know, a big fan of um, Ian Mortimer's books, you know, yeah. the Time Traveller's Guide to Medieval Zip and that thing. He, and he was wonderful. nice enough to, to quote for this one, um, having sort of tried to destroy the, the first book because he thought we'd nicked his title and, and indeed uh -huh. Penguin had. So we were enemies and now we're best of friends. <laughs> yeah, so it can, it can work that way around. But I think his ones are great, you know, because it's just like if you went to medieval Canterbury, like how would you know how to get to the next city? Like, yeah. what would you eat? Where would you stay? How many people would you have to share a bed with? How many lice would be on the mattress? <laughs> These sorts of, you know, and it's, you know, you've come here, I'm staying in Premier, and it's not that difficult, but, you know, there's no lice, and there's probably not going to be a random stranger, and, and, yeah. and well, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> These sorts of, yeah, you relish those random, strange people, I think. Who is it? One well, someone you describe as eccentric, visionary, and perhaps ill-adjusted. I was hoping that you would be when I met you. Um, as Agreed. we all are, yeah, mm. a bit, whatever that means. Mm. Um, so, Am um, I not? Yeah, we don't know you well enough. Oh, I see, okay. Way, who is? We can well say at the end, yeah. We can drum anyone out who is. So, the first place, let's go in the first place. I want to just belt through them and ask you about them for those Please, who don't yeah. know them, because it is an unusual book to try and talk about, sum up, 
Mm. Mm. Fantastic. And as I said to you earlier today, you won't believe this when I say I loved it because you probably think I said that to everyone, but I really loved it. Oh, thank you. Trelec. Yeah. Can you tell us about Trelec? Yeah, Trelec was um, the sort of lost capital of medieval Wales. We think um, if you spend your time reading medieval Welsh tax records, as I'm sure you all do, um, <laughs> there's evidence that it grew from practically nothing, like a small village, beginning of the um, 13th century, to this like um, swaggering metropolis of about 10 or even 20,000 people by the end of the century. Then it mysteriously vanished. No one knew where it went, how it grew so big so quickly. And the interesting thing about that story is that it's about how it was rediscovered. Um, there had been academics who'd been looking for it in the wrong place, it seemed, um, until one day a farmer noticed that moles had been digging up shards of medieval pottery. And they were in the mold, the, the mold hill, so it looked like crushed mouldy strawberries. And this reached the ears of a 26 year old archaeology graduate who, who was like a sort of Balzacian monomaniac figure or a Welsh Indiana Jones perhaps he immediately used his entire life savings to buy the field at auction took most of his parents money as well I think and just dug just dug 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 um, and you're the first thing he found anyone know what the first thing he found was it was a mummified cat he then found a jewel encrusted pilgrim's flask <coughs> and a roof finial to scare off witches and that was just the beginning he continued to dig and basically found the core of this lost medieval city to the complete chagrin of the academics who, who said that this couldn't possibly be true and he was like faking it and how could it have been a city that big if like it's landlocked if it's on a plateau beyond the forest team so when i rocked up i, I met him he, he he was the one you were quoting about yeah. the, you know he, he he was not really i i, I did think he would be this complete eccentric who, who, who wouldn't be very sociable but he, he, he was very genial um, the academics basically yeah, launched this interpretive campaign against them and, and he against them. I was like, what can I contribute to this war, which goes on not just in the muddy fields, but the sort of mud slinging Colosseum of Twitter. And I identified that it was probably a, an early example of a boom town where the king, Edward I, needed to mine iron or smelt iron to build all, you know, the, the swords and the chains and the, and the shields and that he needed to crush the Welsh. That's how it got so big so quickly. But then as we know from the American West, what happens to those places? They explete the minerals, the patrons die, and the whole thing sunk, literally for hundreds of years until the moles dug it up again. And it really makes you think how, as you say, London's threatened, and you mentioned mm. the sunken city of, of Egypt, yeah. or Hermes Heraklion, excuse me. Uh, I can't say it either, it's okay. The columns and stuff. Yeah. And all through there's this beautiful tone of uh, what, Buddhist in Hermit almost. And that applies to Winchelsea, doesn't it? Yeah. It was moved repeatedly. It was translated, yeah. Winchelsea, I don't know if anyone's been to old Winchelsea. Mm -hmm. It's like, and not unless you're a deep sea diver. It was, it's a trick question. You've probably been to what it became because old Winchelsea was this sprawling metropolis, but it was built on a shingle spit, which was unfortunate. But you've probably been to Dungeness. Rometry, yeah. Derek Jarman's house, etc. It used to project from that, where the nuclear power station is today, mm -hmm. to project out towards the cliffs of Fairlight. And it actually was advantageous because it gave it a good location to trade with France. Um, but there were ferocious sea storms as the medieval warm period gave, gave way to the Little Ice Age from 1250. <coughs> and um, these were apocalyptic in nature and, and, and they the sea would claw off entire streets and houses and palaces and owl sanctuaries and you name it into the sea until Edward the King, Edward the First, turns up and, and issues this haunting proclamation that says the greater part of Old Winchelsea is drowned and the rest is hopeless long to stand. But he was not the sort of macho king that was going to let something as puny as nature defeat him. Mm. So he was like, let's rebuild it, you know, a hill. Several miles inland, opposite Rye, with a broad tidal estuary, let's do that. And he forged it to this. This is why this one is so extraordinary. Like it was like a medieval Manhattan. It was forged to this checkerboard layout. The street plans in the book is amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because you don't think of that. Well, medieval, you think of yeah. it. I mean, one needs only walk around. You know, somewhere like Canterbury or Shrewsbury, <coughs> in the city of London. It's like a tagliatelle of twisting, winding <laughs> streets. But but this was, you know, and this was two fingers up to nature. This was like 
we're, we're, we're going to tame the landscape, and it was an affront to the chaotic forces that had laid it low. And the thing that fueled it, which is an, an excuse for me to have brought wine up during this talk, what was this, um, what they described as the creator, the world's happiness, um, something that would inspire, I love this quote, this is from the Liber de Venice from uh, 1304, I don't know if it's stocked, you should stock it, it's great. <laughs> yeah. um, it said the wine would fuel genius and poetical fury. Um, so, they were, so if you go to Winchelsea now, you find these little openings in the street, these were wine caves, wine cellars, wine tasting taverns, and um, there were 70 of them. And it was stipulated actually in by local law, by the law of men, it said whenever they were in operation, you had to have live lute music <laughs> bubbling up into the street. You had to have candles beneath the chins of the frightening gargoyles. So you'd, you'd see all this be inviting. And then you'd go in and you'd see merchants, vintners from all over Europe, piercing the barrels and spraying the wine in people's faces, because that, that's kind of how they drank it. And, and not just red and white, Roses, we, but they had every colour of the rainbow. They had like green wine with grass in it, gold wine with gold in it, believe it or not, winter cherry wine. They had blue wine, which they dyed blue with the Venetian ultramarine dye. Um, and, you know, as long as the wine flowed, the city prospered, but the wine stopped flowing because of the outbreak of the Hundred Years' War. Um, and more tragically, the sea changed tactics and actually went into retreat, silted up the harbour. The whole life lifeblood became exsanguinated until there was just one sailor left no ships and if you go there today it's an eerie place because the because i want to feel it's not an academic book well it, it it's researched with academic rigor i hope you can disagree but it, it like, yeah you, you want to feel these places and when you when you go to winchester that sense of loss and absence is, hangs in the air like a pool it's pervasive um and you go to where the monday market was which was once the hollow blue of trade now it's just a theater of emptiness then you walk for what feels like miles um, until you, you get to a gate, just this gate stranded in its rustic quietude. And this was once one of the main entrances to the city. It's this spectacle of devastation and loss. Um, and, and it really brings home, you know, it's, it's meant to be about the future, this book. You know, odd for a history book, perhaps, but mm -hmm. um, brings home the transience, you know, the, the hubris of cities and places that you know and love. You, you think they're going to be on the map forever. But they, they might actually be in the shadow of oblivion, and you don't realise it. So I bet it's not very morbid. And no, you <laughs> haven't. It's not. It's, that's, that's one of the central mysteries of it, is how cheering the book is. Do you think? Oh, I'm very glad to hear that. Yeah. The sense of transience. I think yeah. you say, well, you, we've all lost things and people, mm. haven't we? If not, Sadly, yeah. as a minimum, our youth. Yeah. And you talk about, you mentioned your father dying in divorce, mm. and I think... What is it you say that these ruins somehow help you become less of a ruin? Is that That's right, yeah. The, um, so that the more you ruminate upon ruins, the less of a ruin you become yourself. Um, which, I, I, as you mentioned, I was going through a period of quite, quite, quite serious emotional turbulence because of the, the divorce and, 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 and the death. Um, and a lot of my friends were like, what, what, what on earth are you playing? This, this sounds like the most morbid project possible. Just going around the whole country and staring at these sort of these relics of destruction, mm. and, 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 not, and isn't that just gonna drag you down to a to sort of worse place? But actually, they're strangely uplifting and yeah. cathartic, and you know, as, as Henry James said when he went to that, he said, you know, the minor key is struck with such felicity, uh, it leaves no sigh unbreathed. Um, I defy anyone at desolate, exquisite Dunwich to be disappointed in anything ever again. And I found that to be true. I think Danish is at the heart of it. Um, you've mentioned music. There's a neuroscientist I read who says that all music is melancholy, even oh, apparently right. happy music. Really? Actually, mm. yeah, if you think about it. What's this business about you having some of this book set to music by your friend Gar Anthony Gardner? William Gardner, yeah. Um, William Gardner. So, uh, well, gosh, there's an awful lot going on there. But, like, but basically, uh, I like someone who's very close to me is an opera composer. Um, and was actually the first person to read the entire manuscript um, and was, was, was just instantly struck, I think he said, by how, how, how well it would lend itself to these kind of um, elegiac um, musical adaptations or, or, or distillations of some of the chapters. Yeah. Um, so we took individual lines from the chapters, it was set to music, um, just as a way of sort of expressing it in a way that obviously I couldn't or didn't do in the, you know, because obviously it's by definition it's written, but 
he, he was very much of the opinion that it, it, it could transcend in some ways and, and you could actually express the essence of these places and their demise um, quite powerfully through music. Um, then it all became a bit sort of postmodern because then he sort of became lost to me. So he sort of became one of the lost oh, places, but then, but then came back again and, and we, like, we, we found that the lost cities had, were sort of representing part of our sort of psyches, which was quite a sort of uh, spooky yeah. discovery. But it was all, I mean, it's, all it's all great now. I mean, there's, there's no personal ruin. I love the fact the book is Favour, who obviously published um, The Wasteland and yeah. T.S. Eliot worked there. And at the launch, you had this music by your friend. You know, Faber, That's right. Faber were a bit worried about that. Which I well, Faber can be quite. Um, I don't know if there's any, anyone from Faber here tonight, though. I hope <laughs> yeah, not. Yeah, a um, simple country. The, well, they do, they do sometimes <laughs> send spies. Um, yeah. the, they can be quite con surprisingly conservative. In They're not, not so much anymore, but wh when I said I'd like one of the chapters to be sung, in, in mm. the you know the, the blood drained from the films, which was just like oh that's a really bad idea because like what if it's bad and then no one's going to buy the book and then yeah like and there was sort of like so we actually came to a compromise and the opera version of uh, the city that fell off the cliff the dance chapter was sung out um, in the after party venue which was a basement bar in Soho um, and that was quite fun because we didn't hire the whole we hired like three fifths of it but there were also like members of the public in the, and just the ghastly well to my ears ghastly music music so i wouldn't be able to tell if it was like minor or melancholic or not um and then suddenly that got turned off <laughs> then this opera song just got like song live what was the other music um what that they were playing before yeah it was just like sort of um really bad like heavy drum and bass heavy sausage yeah, yeah heavy like, and then suddenly yeah. this but actually it, it won over all the yeah. people that they, they were quite fascinated by it and um it, it, it was a nice thing but faber well what yeah we're worried about it and, and also there was a lot of risks i took in writing this mm. um which they sometimes were would try to rein in like the, the, a lot of the personal sections where i visit these places sometimes on foot, sometimes by bike, sometimes by boat. Um, it, th th there was a school of thought amongst some of the editors that that was distracting. And, and, I and wanted more personal. Yeah, I, everyone well, agrees. So Next did I. book, yeah. plug it in. Well, because yeah. Because it's a you, it's a book anyway. Yeah. Dunwich, we must get, Dunwich is, I think, the heart of the book. Mm. For those who don't know, can you summarise? For those who haven't been or don't know about it, Dunwich. Yeah, so Dunwich. Um, <laughs> Suffolk. Uh, Suffolk, uh, the capital of Saxon East Anglia, a roaring trade in herring with Iceland um, and um, other commodities with other British ports, um, grew to prosperity um, by about 1250. Um, and then the same series of storms, medieval climate change, but this was the cause, it didn't have anything to do with human behaviour, but nonetheless it happened, um, meant that um, in 1288, about but like the equivalent of like the East End of London was just swept off the cliff, um, and it was a frightening scene. The survivors the next day came down and just saw through a haze of salt spray and mist just what had been their city, or bit of their city, dissolved in the sea with like battered hot. Like so, the roof beams were turned into battering rams in this sort of <clears throat> bloody spume, and people would have had the rare distinction of, of, of feeling what it was like to be propulsed backwards off a cliff in their sleep. <clears throat> into the waves below um, and this horrific whirlpool of bodies and cattle and the feathers of Scandinavia um, confronted them and this precipitated because it was built on a cliff a process of erosion which was sped up by more storms and more and more and more of the city was eaten away by what Henry James called that great um, ruminating indefatigable lip the sea which would just take more and more bites by Queen Elizabeth's reign, Elizabeth I, that is, um, half of it was underwater. A map is produced and topographers are sent off on, on their missions to map what's left. Um, and more and more got taken. So by the 18th century, if you were in the main market square, you go to the bookshops and you know the, the, the coffee houses and then just a sheer drop. Um, until all that remained by 1900 was one church, pretty much, the Church of All Saints. Um, and this used to be way out west, but by that point there were these fantastic postcards that were um, made which just show it teetering on the brink and the cliff getting closer and closer and closer.
to all that's left is this sort of forlorn shard. And the city had loads of churches, didn't it? The city did. The city big. had eight parish churches, which was yeah. phenomenal. And that might not sound like very, but like Winchelsea only had two. Eight parish churches, that's a lot. And also a further um, 10 monasteries. Um, so there, there was a lot. Um, and then that fell in 1922, plunged off the cliff, crashed into the sea, joined all the other ghost churches. And you know, it's it said that if you go and stand on the cliff, you're meant to be able to hear the sounds of the, mm -hmm. the bells from the drowned churches, like sounding from the deep. Um, but then, as I put in the book, what, what physically vanishes beneath the sea can sometimes rebuild itself in the mind. Um, and it became a lightning rod for these romantic writers and artists who found such beauty in decay um, in the ways that we were talking about earlier in, in an uplifting sense. Um, and still to this day, people go on pilgrimages to Dunwich. But I think the chilling thing about it is that it, it's quite hard to write about that, or indeed to read about that probably, without seeing it as some awful premonition of what might lay in store for a lot of our coastal cities because of climate change. And you can find quite frightening maps online about how much of London will be underwater by 2090, potentially. Um, so who knows, perhaps, you know, in time, people will go and stand on Hampstead Heath and look and listen out for the bells of the drowned Wren churches. And so oh, that's where St Paul's Cathedral used to be, just like people went to. Um, but what you take away from it is even if that does happen, obviously I hope it doesn't, but if it does happen, then at least it will be remembered and romanticised yeah. and it won't and, and, and it's a wider point about the book that as long as you keep telling the stories then these places are not gonna vanish in their entirety. I asked the editor of a penguin book on climate change actually what yeah. it wasn't a bit cheerless and mm. she said well no just think of it as Mad Max let's have a ball and enjoy it while we're at it and try right. and not try and stop it as well yeah and right, at least yeah. you highlight that in the coda is it's not a sort of just romantic shell guide but mm. Mm. Fitzgerald, um, who translated the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, so we'll know the, the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam from Fitzgerald lines. Mm. He had an amazing relationship with Dunwich, one of those romantics, mm. didn't he? Mm. Can you tell us about him and Keane that I didn't know about? Well, he, he used to, um, many members of the sort of literati, I suppose, who, who was just obsessed with going to Dunwich. And um, there's one letter he wrote, he wrote this incredibly detailed, fresh, vivid letters which we've, we've both read um, and you know, someone invites him to, to go to York or somewhere or somewhere further north and he says I'll be totally honest with you I probably I will come up but I probably won't get further than Dunwich because I just love it so much the, the way the sort of sadness hangs in the air like the salt spray he, he was one of many who, who formed a sort of artistic colony I would say in Dunwich and, and you see this through throughout sort of time and space you know you think that artists move in to, to Berlin after the war, like artists moved to Detroit and artists are drawn to these places to sort of embody loss. And he formed a friendship with the punch cartoonist Charles Keane, who was also a sketcher. And what we didn't know um, was he was a Keane bagpipe player as well. And on hot August nights, Keane was. Yeah. Keane, Keane, yeah. Mm. He used to go down and sit on the beach and, as he put it, scurl away by the sad sea waves, um, just imagining the, the, the city like rearing from the deep. Um, and Fitzgerald used to go and prop himself up um, against the ruins of, uh, of the monastery, Greyfriars Monastery, and just imagine how, you know, the, the monks that used to have their massive fried fish meals and guzzling their five pints of wine a day and lit by the same sun, um, and meditates upon the ruins in, in a really interesting way. You know, when you stare at ruins like that, they're at once of their time, but a derailment of the timeline as well. So they represent some time on hold. They bring home the transients of the presence, but also seem to prognosticate some sort of future decline. This is this is why he, he would sort of go there every day in the, in the summer. And then Henry James comes along later, but it, it's this place that people, are, and remember at that time as well, <clears throat> the sea was still, it's the Victorian, the sea was still claiming more and more of it. So they had the added thrill of, you know, the. The hostel they were staying in, the taverns, and they probably wouldn't be there for that much longer, and that sort of charged the landscape with a sort of mysterious significance. Um, There's great moments where you're a bit like that, and you describe getting there. So you're in a taxi in the rain, yeah. you're leaving Dunwich. Um, yes, transport's quite hard around there. Very. <laughs> and yeah. your description of the ferry from Aberdeen uh. to get round to St Kilda, you know, it's just 
those fairies, those Caledon and McBrain fa fairies can be pretty grim, can't they? But beautifully so. Yeah, uh, beautifully grim. I thought that was... And that, can I, do, you, do you sense that... Sorry, I'm interrupting. No, no, what I wouldn't please do. do. What were you going to say? The fairy? Oh, oh no, I, I, I was just going to say that I, I, I found that fairy road from Aberdeen to the Orkneys um, just sort of beautifully sort of lonely. Um, there, was, there was a cinema in the middle of the ferry that was just playing a film to no one. <laughs> <laughs> and that just seemed to encapsulate. I seized upon it. I thought this was a, you know, an inspired uh, foreshadowing of everything that happened in mm. the book. Of course, they tried to cut that bit. They said it was irrelevant. Um, <clears throat> but I fought for it. And also, just kind of rocking oneself to sleep in the sleep pods, and then you know, en entering the the, the city. And um, that, that that sort of space was just the the, the perfect sort of contemplative space to, to imagine the whole journey that lay ahead. Yeah. Um, and again, the th you mentioning St Kilda, that was another trying journey um, because I don't, for those of you who've been to St Kilda, or, you'll know that there's no guarantee you're actually going to get there. Like you're not going to be shipwrecked probably, but like the weather conditions, it's the remotest part of the United Kingdom, the Outer Hebrides, um, often the ships just have to turn back. Um, it's a real struggle and has always been. Okay, When I went, um, about half the passengers were vomiting over the <laughs> keel. One sort of quite macho Russian guy <laughs> had like half his teeth smashed out by the because he was catering next to the mast and and he was quite upset about it, just like staring at the the teeth sort of vanishing into the into the sea. But he was actually remarkably good humoured about it in, in, in the long term, but not not ideal. Um, but that's part of the appeal of St Kilda. It's it's a real headache to get there, um, but when you do, you feel like you've achieved something, and and then you you this like barren rock mountain which seems to be some sort of vision of, I, I saw it as some vision of like a post-apocalyptic future when mm. society and power structures had broken down and everyone retreated to the kind of autarky they had, like grabbing puffins from cliffs and baking them into porridge and, and you know using them, but just not reliant on the outside world, which St Kilda was. And when it became reliant on the outside world, then that, that's when the seeds of its decline were sown until the whole thing had to be evacuated. Yeah, the, the evacuation of that and the evacuation of the Welsh Valley for water for Liverpool is also yeah. a chapter about Jesus. What do you mean about drowning dogs? Did the St Kilda people have mm. to drown their dogs at the end? That, well, they did, they did drown their dogs. I mean, it, it's a bit puzzling because it's like, it's a, like, did they have to do that? So the, well, the, the final thing, like, they had a final meal of the said puffin porridge. Yeah. Um, they left the peat fires burning. They left um, their Bibles open at the Book of Exodus, which was... <coughs> Opposite. Wow. Um, and then they rounded up their dogs and tied weights around their necks, put them in sacks and chucked them off into the bay. So when the boat came to rescue them the next day, the, 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 you know, the sort of dog, drowned dogs, sort of floating in some cases. Um, and I, I think, I mean, St Kilda was a daunting chapter to write because there have been over a thousand books on St Kilda. <laughs> and I really, the one thing I really dislike doing is just regurgitating other people's work so I thought I'd either write about places that had not been written about or try and do it in a different way yeah. so the St Kilda chapter it's very much the, the eye of the beholders what were all these travellers looking for through the centuries when I knew what I was looking for but what were they looking for in the 18th century that what was natural man like the, the noble that's what they were doing the Victorians were doing something different um, and the dogs it, they, it really struck me that they were like the guardians almost spiritually of the archipelago, the dogs didn't really belong to individual families. It's a bit like if you've been to the Greek island of Hydra, there were just cats everywhere, and they don't really belong to, the, the, the dogs were just a sort of collective force that embodied it. So I think when they abandoned it, that was almost a sort of ritual purification, um, and, you know, because they could have taken the dogs, um, yeah. but, uh, but didn't, and it's it sort of tragic. The, I think there's some other dog violence. Yes, the dogs that get a bad time <coughs> in this book, the, yeah. in the Winchelsea chapter, the, Pirates of Winchelsea used to kill. They hated um, Southampton, so they would raid Southampton, kill the leading citizens and their dogs, then hang them from the masts. So you'd have like corpse of a man, corpse of a dog, and then swirl around rival cities to, to keep them in check. So, not don't read it to your dog. No. <laughs> Before we chuck it open for questions. Um, I just want, really I haven't mentioned Scarborough at all. Mm. What's interesting about that in the Orkneys? Could you? 
decent yeah. picture of that. Well, Scarborough, that, that, that's where it began. Maybe that's the heart of the book, actually. Yeah, I, I, no, I think Donich is. I think yeah. I, I, I would agree with that. But Scarlet Bray, I, I, I found it a bit of a challenge. The first chapter is always daunting because you're like, well, what if people, this is just rubbish. Like, <laughs> um, but, but also it's prehistory. So there were no sources, there were no written sources, which I, I'd never really done anything um, set in prehistory before. Um, and I found it a challenge, like, not to veer into fiction because you, know, you, you could just fictionalise it. Yeah. And it but but that, I think that would have got the book off on the wrong note perhaps um but in the year 1850 a ferocious storm swept the lid the sort of grassy lid of the sand dune revealing this almost perfectly preserved commune within um and believe it or not that had been built in 3200 bc and it's very hard to get your head around something that old so it's actually older than the pyramids older than stonehenge the most um perfectly preserved Neolithic permanent structure in northern Europe, and it's immensely significant. Why did it survive? Because it's very hard to find a tree on Orkney, so they built it out of stone that was entombed in sand. And ironically, because sand is like the antithesis of form, but it was also a really good medium of preservation. Um, this was a time when humanity stopped marauding around all the time and actually put down roots, um, worked the land, agriculture was born. Civilization was born because if you don't have permanent roots and agriculture, you can't really have literacy and culture and political structures. Um, and it sort of paved the way for all the other places that I looked at. Um, and I don't, one's relationship with deep time is always sort of a bit sort of problematic because it's quite. You know, but I certainly had a mental picture of a really sort of desperate life of people eking a living just with axes and just fighting off. Um, you know, invaders, and stuff. but it seems like it was a fundamentally peaceful community. They had a really good diet, lots of fish, lots of meat, um, even some vegetables. And um, when you stare into these caverns, you see things that you've probably all got on your own houses, like fridges and bed frames and mantelpieces mm. and really good plumbing. Um, so there's a sense of mellow domesticity that cuts through that sort of cold abyss of all these years. They did have some alien practices as well because permanence was a radical thing because up until that point most built structures were built to house not the living but the dead so this was and they were sort of like well why should the earth bother propping up these walls so you find lots of skeletons underneath the walls which look like they might have been sacrifices just to give the earth a bit of a treat a reason to keep propping it up they also had a unique approach to sort of rubbish collection they, you know these days we put it out and hope the council takes it away. But they used to smear it around their houses, all the refuse, so this organic wrap of midden, it was called. So the whole thing sunk, became sort of subterranean. By the end, like the streets were underground, you'd have to crawl or slither through. Um, and so much of their worldview, we just don't know anything about, and we never will, and we can guess, but we won't know. And that's kind of part of the, the joy of that chapter. The sort of joy yeah. is in the guessing. It's like responding. I never knew about the tunnels between the houses. And yeah, and yeah. And they were all the same size house. So it was quite egalitarian, which very unusual, certainly by medieval standards, to have something like. So, what was going on there, and what the relationship was to the big spiritual? Yeah, you ones. imagine them communicating with each other as well down these tunnels, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of slithering um, through. Yeah. Must throw it open, but the Gordon Child, the mm. archaeologist who didn't really want to do field work, who excavated Scarborough, mm. why do you think he committed suicide? I, that's un, not un, a banal question. Undoubtedly, because he was worried he was becoming a burden on the state, and mm. uh, he was a communist. Really? And he, he, like, like, uh, yeah, and he actually portrayed Scarborough Bray as a sort of proto-communist <laughs> commune. Because it's—I don't call it a village. Because to me, the word village has connotations of. sort of Clopping hooves and the bells arches. and cricket, the arches. They didn't have anything like that. Um, so he, he I, yeah, undoubtedly he was worried about that. He he was seeing the first signs of dementia, I think it was, and he threw himself off a cliff in the Black Mountains in Australia. Um, it could also have been because he, you know, he he had a, he had a brain the size of Mars. He could do long division in Latin and like, you know, he, he was like, well, what's the point of going on if I if, if my mental faculties are corroding? So. One of those two things, or both. Your description of him is wonderful. As oh, thank you. I hope it's not too insulting. <laughs> <laughs> when of those flights, I just say there's lots. Lots of the reviews said this that 
you can write that you can't assume that about a historian or a travel writer but sadly not yeah so <laughs> right do you go and walk in the country and come back with those ideas or do you do they come to you when you wake up in the morning uh very good uh it's a good question actually i i mean to be totally honest with you um i'd always go to the pub oh, with right. a note with a notebook and drink red wine and, and i and i write out in notebooks longhand stream of consciousness just whatever's going like how to portray dunwich how to portray a sea storm how to evoke the sense of loss that you feel in these places um then i put it in the drawer for a night or two come back to it type it out and i find that decanting process really helpful um, when you see what you've written in a different form, um, I then email it to myself. It's quite a complicated alchemy. <laughs> and I sort of go through it on the phone, almost like I'm receiving a WhatsApp message. And then you just, what works leaps out and everything else falls off, like lamb off a boat and is immediately apparent. And about 9% of what you've written could be salvageable. That, that's how I got the really sort of lyrical passages in there, yeah. the, the poetic bits. And, and because I collaborate with this composer, I, I write opera libretto as well, which is, I think the best English libretto is like a cross between the demotic and the poetic, so you, it just needs to be quite conversational. But then with these poetic flights of fancy that you've sort of allowed yourself, so um, that I, I think that it doesn't really come to me on a on a walk or a run or anything like that. It's it's just scribbling it out, okay. um, seeing what longhand. That's interesting. Longhand, but then decanting into you know like a, an email, yeah. so you see the cold. Helvetica font and mm. that that's quite unforgiving you know to, to, to imagine you're reading it like does it work or is it overwritten and I think for me like th those sorts of really descriptive passages and creativity that quite a lot of it is about volume and you know often the loudest words are adjectives and if you take them out it's infinitely more powerful but sometimes you, you need them um, if you've got sentences that are overly loud then you've lost the reader but you know, you don't want it to be insubstantial and, heaven forbid, bland. Um, and also, like, I'm, I'm on a sort of journey because I, I like, I did do a um, PhD, so I, like, and, I, and I was set for academia, um, but I had a sort of negative, last minute negative epiphany at the Viva exam, the Viva, you know, the, the three hour interrogation, um, which I found very disappointing because they were meant to be world experts in my subject, which was the history of the, the media in the 18th century. But the first hour was about how, how they thought that I didn't know how to use a semicolon, um, and then, and I didn't really. But I thought that if, I thought that was just a bit disappointing. But that, that, and I sort of stared into these cold dead eyes. Not not all academics like this. Yeah. Um, but I, I really wanted to like take the research skills, but express it in a way that I felt was um, more evocative and, yeah. and, and with personalities and characters and stories and pace rather than just marshalling evidence and theories and having to come up with something new and, you know, because sometimes it's, you know, the old theories are the right ones, you know, it's not always like... It's about. Yeah. Yeah. So there's vestiges of that, of, of that. I mean, there's a lot of footnotes in there, for example. Like, I, I feel quite uncomfortable referring to something that seems outlandish without... Oh, it's very academically rigorous. You've kept yeah. all those techniques. Yes, yeah. yeah. I think it's because I've secretly had nightmares at the... There is going to be some exam which i don't know about and <laughs> know. they're going to be like how do you know the king had giant meatballs encased in jelly that particular day he must yeah, quite so. enjoy doing that um well my <laughs> yeah my phd right, was part of the reason waterstones canterbury's had about three thousand or so like, oh right um, Amazing. similar experience yeah but um if you know the macaulay quote about he said one day an artist will be sitting on a broken arch in london bridge sketching the ruins of london i thought mm. of that, and i thought of i didn't know that engulfed but cathedral beautiful. debussy as well yeah so there's a, so much in the book um, are there any questions? Because I think I've hogged your company far too much. Okay. I've been fortunate to have your book for six months. I got the hardback. Good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let me say what an original subject it is. I really enjoyed Thank reading you. it. I could still delve into it. But more specifically, you know, obviously all the research you've put into it, you've an authority on Winchelsea, and on a recent seller tour I did, mm. We questioned the gentleman taking us around. Can you assure us? No, there was no smuggling in Winchelsea. And I find that a little bit difficult. Well, you, I wouldn't say that. Uh, there's another author who's written a book called Alex Preston. He's our yes. next. Oh, is he? Okay. Oh, He's fantastic. There, yeah. Well, I, yeah, that, I wouldn't say that to him. He'd, he'd have like a, a whole weight of uh, reputation. Again. It would definitely. I mean, I've read. 
uh, Daniel Defoe and John Eveler, and they both refer to smuggling directly in the, those. Those were what the wine caves became. Um, and what, what what were the, the guides sort of grounds for, for saying this? Did, did, well, did they maintain the cellars were built before the buildings. And their prime raison d'etre was to keep <coughs> keep the wine yeah. both at a stable temperature, but also for security, because the raving parties, which you refer to in the mm. account, would have just casted it all off. Mm. Um, and the town was sacked, wasn't it? Many a time, yeah. Many yeah. a time. Sure so that was the one place it was kept. And yeah. he, he categorically said, no, there wasn't smuggling you know, going on. But I don't know what period mm. of history he was referring to. Yeah, I think definitely, but the... 18th century was quite renowned as a sort of smart, like, like places like Deal as well, like as a sort of warren of mm. yeah. smugglers' mm. dens. But uh, actually, if you're um, free, I, I think it might be sold out. But Alex and I are doing a event in the cellars, yeah, I've seen that. and in my cellar, it's going to oh, really? be like a wine cave with all these like blue and wine, gold wine, mm. coconut shells, and, and then his is going to be a smugglers' den. I wanted to get people to slither between. But that that was um, <laughs> overruled, um, and, and we're going to do a little tour of Winchelsea and end up in conversation. Um, it's quite hard to deal with the powers that be, and we did want to do like quite a few in the same day, but the, the, we could only do it twice, and mm -hmm. not they're worried about candles and things in the cellars. But um, oh, yeah, so not very medieval. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I'm sure Alex will take that up with you. Anyone else? Yeah, I've got a question. Um, your first book about London is yeah. very good, Thank you. and it reminded me of that book Perfume because it oh. kind of puts you oh, wow. in history, mm. you know, the sensations and everything else. Why do you think they don't teach history like that? Because if history is taught in a way that turns mm. people off of it, <laughs> right? Yes. But why, why, why not use that kind of model mm. to make everyone interested mm. in it? Because people think, oh, that's history; it's dead. Mm. So mm. what? Mm. Yeah bringing it to life uh i mean it's a good question it's it's a sort of intellectual injustice i, I think it's probably because if you so, so yeah it would be like the kind of essays you get set for gcc a level they're like you know what was the king's desire for a divorce the only reason the english reformation happened but if if the question were like um evoke you know what was going through henry's mind when he stared at on Anne Boleyn for the first time mm. and, and, and when he sort of like the idea of taking over all the church lands like um, I think they would probably say it would veer too far into a sort of like English language mm. essay and people wouldn't feel the need to like base it on fact mm. um, I think also like when you um, when I did history at A level it was the, the, there was more of it like we, we did the Lutheran Reformation we did like Hitler and the Nazis and some of the books we read were, were extremely readable um, but it's just the way it's assessed. Mm. I think that that's the problem, and, and I found that um, particularly at university level, like you, they're still beholden to the this like Renaissance idea of the essay, yeah. which goes back to Montaigne. An essay was like an attempt, but his essays were much more like spiraling. And so you had to play the game, of yeah. being academic. You sort of yeah. do, but it's, but I think that the problem is academics get very catty because when they produce papers, often mm. um, it's very like new theory, argument, evidence. You get a few that do actually make a really good transition and they write stuff that's both academically rigorous and like a rollicking good read. Mm. And so my supervisor, at, um, well, my, my main history tutor when I was at Oxford was called um, Faramas de Boivla. He wrote a book called The Origins of Sex, saying that the first sexual revolution was not the 1960s, but the 1660s. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's a, 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 published by Penguin. It's, it's pretty good read you know and and it did get a wider readership and you you do you do get historians like of course, you know you get like uh simon sharma would be a good example mm. or um niall ferguson on the other end of the political spectrum like so it, it is possible but i yeah i, I agree i think it's it's too narrow um mm. and imagination should be rewarded a bit more mm -hmm. but i can see that might be quite hard to second assess. part of the question is yeah. with all the new chat gpts and things how mm. are you going to use it for your next book the ai part oh that? definitely not no <laughs> maybe sure? for the press release but no i definitely don't want a, like a robot writing my book um i think it's uh yeah those of us who have quite unusual and distinctive writing styles will probably be safe from the robots for a while um mm. i think it will be really helpful for doing you know 
things, as I say, like, like press releases, and it would be good for a GCSE essay, but um, I definitely, I am working on a new project, but I'm not allowed to say but what I it is. I was thinking of your stream of consciousness moment, I yeah. might be able to provide an element that you might not be able to have without the wine and the stream of consciousness. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wonder, but I want, I want the wine and the stream of consciousness, yeah. like, I, I wouldn't want the robot, I would, I would be very unhappy. It's coming it. for you. I, I don't think it is, I mean, I it's, think it's coming for some people, but I think I'm going to be safe because it's quite pretty I, I asked it to write an ode to limoncello in the style of stephen king and it did a serviceable job yes but it was quite obvious and predictable like yeah. what was going to happen wow. but it could improve of course so. i think we're all going to remember that for the rest of our lives that sentence um, <laughs> which one and the limoncello the stephen, yeah great right, yeah. and also well, to make non-fiction less like wikipedia i'm just going to i think long non-fiction has to be not just like wikipedia yeah you can't of course write a book of coffee anymore because we can look mm. it up it yeah. has to be you standing in the rain outside Dunwich said so favourable wrong. But yeah. anyway, your question was great. Um, is there anyone else? The lady at the back. Um, as I understand, the focus of this book is kind of UK based, Planet yeah. of the Stoke. That's right. Um, are there any other kind of sites globally that you find kind of intriguing in terms of the loss element and the grief and the vanishing kind of essence of these sites? Yeah, um, it, you're, you're right. It is very sort of Britain based and. Okay. Yeah. When I um, was, was coming up with an idea of putting proposals together, um, I looked at a lot of European and international comparisons. Like Detroit really interested me, and the, the fall of, of, of that city and, and, and its reclamation, you know, how, how these places kind of bounce back. There's the, the place you mentioned earlier, um, Th Thericlis, he he or I, can't, I can't really remember how to say it. But um, the, the, when I was coming up with the idea, there was an exhibition at the British Museum called like, Drowned Worlds, which was extraordinary because it actually had all the sort of statues and, and you know, like brickwork and masonry that ended up on the seabed and juxtaposed against like a sort of board telling you what it was. Um, and it all sort of links back to the myth of um, Atlantis. You know, it's, it's a, that, that sort of mythological, I didn't, it does come into the book a little bit, um, but basically we, we decided that if we were to include these international clubs, it might sort of detract from the narrative coherence because people just want to be immersed in that one particular place. So there's just a few references to it. But some, someone has done a thing called the Atlas of Vanishing Places, um, the Atlas of Unusual Places, and they that is all over the world, but, but it's very different. It's like a with like an atlas and, and as the name suggests and you get like a paragraph or two right up like you, you don't really get lost in the in the lost places but it's uh yeah it's i mean it, it, it someone could do that as a like the international shadow land but not couple, me a couple more questions yes um obviously shadow lands i haven't read it yet so i will um it's about to journey through the lost through lost britain mm. would you be interested in doing a journey through sites in Britain that are vanishing. I'm mm. thinking in particular, you talk about Dunwich and mm -hmm. further up the coast in Norfolk, there's Haysborough, mm. uh, which is a town that is, that's happening, what happened to Dunwich is happening um, right. uh, frequently. Um, there are roads that just finish because the, mm. uh, the sea has reclaimed them. Um, of course, the, um, the poorer elements of the, town, of the town's population are kind of like farmed out close to the cliff and more right. the, um, the wealthy are all moving in, in land. Oh dear. Um, <laughs> That's not going to end well. <laughs> no, no. Is it, and there was, when I went there, there was a kind of like lawlessness to this mm. um, community by the, by the cliffs. Mm. Um, ended up calling the Coast Guard because some kids were up to no good in um, uh, battling against the cliffs in, mm. with, with the waves. And we called the Coast Guard and we almost felt like we weren't going to leave because they swarmed our car. Mm. Um, <coughs> but that, somewhere like Haysborough or, or um, coastal communities that are literally vanishing to um, like rural former mining communities mm. or where I'm from, I'm from the black country, which has mm. lost a complete sense of identity yeah. um, and is quite desolate. Would you be interested in kind of exploring a vanishing Britain having lost? Yeah, um, well, th there's, um, when you get to the coda of the book, um, the, I do look at places like, like none of the ones you, well actually the, the former mining, like, I do look at those briefly, but places that are strikingly falling into the sea like, this, mm. like Fairbourne in Wales, yeah. where the council have embraced a policy called managed oblivion, yeah. 
it's sinister, which is basically means they've stopped maintaining some defensive. Mm. Skipsea in Yorkshire, similar, like the cliff is so close to people's front that the seawater actually oozes in beneath the door as they're, as they're just in the housing. Um, and uh, coastal cities like Portsmouth and Hull, um, I didn't really, like, I, I wouldn't, I don't want to write anything really like on the same theme on the, of this particular Chatterlands again, because I, m much like with, um, I think a lot of London writers, they start off by doing something quite broad, but then it gets more and more and more esoteric until they're writing about, you know, a particular lamp post <coughs> or a particular kind of telephone brief. Um, so I, when I did Lost London, trying to work out what to do next, then I was like, let's broaden it out to Lost Britain. Um, and then I'm, I'm pleased that I did put in those contexts of places that are disappearing now. The original idea was actually to start with that, then to loop back and say, this has all happened before. Mm. But it, that might have set it off on a bit too much of a journalistic mm -hmm. note. There is a bit of journalism in it. Um, so I don't think so, but it's also the kind of thing, you, it, it's in the media, you, you, like people are aware of these places that are sort of sinking. And there's a lot of documentaries about them. So I'm confident that, that these are gonna be, I mean, ironically put on, on the map, even if mm. they, they won't be on the map for much longer. Do you see? Um, so, so yeah, and I'm sure the, People are, 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 are other people are writing about those kind of places that are themselves vanishing at the minute. But yeah, that's great. Okay, well, I think we should move to a signing. We've reached our allotted time. Um, Matthew's going to sit here and sign, and the book is five pounds off as ever because we do that here. Um, but um, I've really enjoyed it, and you've been a fantastic audience. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.